All right, so in this video, we're going to take a look at how to model some of these power electronic converters we've been looking at. Because what we've seen so far are nonlinear circuits, and these nonlinear circuits are usually difficult to control. I mean, we have no idea what their dynamic responses look like in terms of the different variables that may change. Um, so it's really important to, if we want to have a sort of practical application of, of power electronics that we have some type of control. Um, usually it's some closed loop feedback control. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at what we call a linearized model. So we're going to look at the process of linearizing these circuits that we've looked at. And we'll do an example with uh, with the boost converter because that's the most, uh, well, seeing an example is the, is the simplest way to figure out how to do the entire process. And you can repeat this process um, for many different converters and you'll get, you'll, you'll, I mean, arrive at some type of similar model. Of course, each converter will have its own unique characteristics and so on. And I should also mention that linearized models are not the only model. You can have a bunch of different ways to, there are there are a number of different ways to model these circuits. Um, you can have like switched averages. Uh, you can have, you can average certain components. You can average certain parts of the circuits. But the linearized model is, is one of the most uh, common and systematic ways to control uh, these converters. Uh, there are limitations, um, and we'll discuss some of those later. And so if you're familiar with um, the uh, MOSFETs and BJTs and so on, we do analysis in those cases called small signal analysis, right? So when we do like do with MOSFET amplifiers or BJT amplifiers, there are certain um, models that we have for small signal amplifiers, we call them. This is also kind of a, I mean, it, it's not kind of, it is a small signal um, model, basically. And so it has limitations on how, like over the ranges uh, that it might be, might be valid or invalid, right? So, so what we're going to do is we're going to start with some type of converter topology that we have. And we said that in this video, we'll look at the boost converter. So the boost converter looks something like this, okay? So if you're not familiar with the boost converter, I will link the video in the description below. And you can look at how we derive its operating characteristics and so on, waveforms and such. And I should also mention that this process that we're going to use here, this linearization, uh, also will produce the the model that we're used to with the conversion ratio of the boost converter. So it's kind of a uh, it's a complete model of what's going to be going on in the converter's dynamics. So we're going to call that v i uh, v n and v o. We're going to label this, this is going to be L, we'll call this D, this is C and R. Maybe we don't label that D because we have a variable called D. So uh, we're going to call this thing here I N and I'm going to call this thing here I L. Technically they're the same current, but I just want to distinguish the, with, with the fact that this is an input current and this is an inductor current. And in this case, they end up being the same current, but in the general case, they are not. So you might have some type of, um, like in a buck converter or something, the inductor current and the um, input current are not the same, for instance. So what we're going to do is we're going to show that this approach can be used in general, and it can also produce the DC model, as I mentioned before. We're going to need a couple of things. And the things we're going to need, we're going to need the volt second balance, so VSB, and then the capacitor charge balance. We can call that CCB. And then we're going to do, we're going to take these two concepts and we're going to combine them with the idea of sort of a small perturbation. What I mean by that is that if I have a curve like this, and let's say you consider it an operating point here, I'm going to say, okay, you can operate in, if you were to like sort of zoom this thing out, right, that would look fairly linear, regardless of what the overall shape of the curve is. And so if that's the case, then what we're going to do is we're going to consider some operating point, this will be our operating point, some nominal condition, let's call it x, and that'll be a capital X. And then what we're going to do is we're going to have some type of small variation and we can call this thing little x. And so basically what we're going to say is we're going to say our circuit operates at some nominal condition, which is usually the required condition. And then we have some small variations, either up or down, depending on the variable and depending on what's happening. Up or down could mean a bunch of different things, but either it can, it, it can, it can go either way basically in this curve. Okay. And so that's what we're going to be this sort of small perturbation that we're going to apply. So we can use these concepts and we can de develop the transfer functions uh, for any converter, right? So what we're going to do is the process is first. We, what we do is we, we first we average it, then we do we apply our small little perturbation, then we look at the small signal construction of the model because we're going to make an entirely different, well not entirely, but somewhat different circuit model out of this because this circuit here is nonlinear. 
But by the time we're done with all this, we're going to have a linear circuit. Okay, so again, the process is averaging, perturbation, and then small signal construction. So we can write that here. Maybe so we say so we say averaging. We're gonna we're gonna average. We're going to have a perturbation, right? So which this means like a small disturbance, and then three we're gonna have small signal. Uh, small signal. Let's say construction or we can say uh, circuit, whatever you want to call it. But we're going to make a small signal model of the circuit, okay? And in all of these cases, in any one of these analysis types of things, where if you're ever going through and you're doing this process for any converter, you need three things usually. Well, not usually, but I guess always, because we're going to model the entire converter around these things. So what do you need? You need VL, so you need the inductor voltage. So that's this voltage here, VL. You need IC which is the capacitor current that we have here, right? And then you need the input current. So you need IN. And in this case, IN and IL are the exact same. If they're not, then you can, you know, you can determine IN. If they are, then it's convenient and you can just do it this way, okay? So what we're going to do then is we're going to, we're going to, we're going to step through the converter's operation, basically, the two different modes. Well, not modes, but regions of operation. So you have when, the, when the, the transistor is on and when the transistor is off, right? So there's basically two conditions, right? So let's say when the transistor is on, you have this condition, right? So you have the inductor is connected straight to ground here. And then this side, you have basically just this capacitor like this, and you have this resistor, right? So we can call this one. This is from zero to DT, okay? And on the other hand, you have from DT to T, right? And so in that case, what happens is the switch is turned off. So the inductor is connected directly through the diode to the output, right? So this is the situation you have here. And so now in this case, we have here, this is VL. And I should mention, this is going to be a fairly uh, involved video relative to the things we've seen before, because there's a lot of uh, mathematical, uh, well, the, the equations are not difficult, but there's a lot of, uh, there's, there's a bit of a derivation and all that to do. And this is expected since we want to develop a circuit model. So this is going to be V in here. And this is VL here. And of course, I'm labeling these quantities because that's what we know we need, right? So this is going to be I in. And this is usually a good idea regardless of what you're doing. It's a good idea to label the quantities that you know you need. Okay, so we said we need VL, we need I in, and we need IC. We have all three labeled here. And this is the situation that we have in the two different conduction modes of the switches, basically. So the switches can have, can operate in either of these conditions, right? Right. Now what we're going to do is we're going to write an equation. We're going to get expressions for VL, IC, and IN. Okay. So in this case, VL equals what? VL, well, in general, we know that VL equals D, uh, sorry, L, D, I, L by DT. And in this case, if you look at that, the, the circuit, this equals VN. And I'm using a lowercase here, which I guess I technically should here as well because I'm assuming that this is a general, generalized signal. I'm not assuming it's AC or DC yet. We will later on when we're trying to develop more uh, precise models of what it is that we're looking for. But in this case, we're just looking at the general models, okay? So you have VN, you have VO, and you have VL as well. Okay, so that's VL. It's quite straightforward. The inductor is connected directly to the DC source. Uh, on the left side, that is. Uh, and then what you have for IC is it's going to be the output current, right? So this output current is going to equal, we know that in a capacitor, this is C, D, V, C by DT. And that equals minus V, C over R, because the current will actually flow in this direction. Uh, and this current is defined in the opposite direction. Or another way to think of it is if you were to look at this current relative to this, to the polarity of the output voltage, uh, they, they're in the opposite direction, so we follow a sort of passive sign convention when we do this stuff. Anyhow, that's negative VC over R, and then you have I in is going to equal I L, which is fairly straightforward. Okay, now on this side, you have VL is going to equal V, well, let's, let's, let's stay consistent. So this is also DIL by DT, and that's going to be V in minus V O. Okay, and then you have IC, which is again going to be C, D, V, C by DT. And that's going to be I, L minus V, C over R. And we get that because in this case, we have this current here 
I L. Now I could have written I N equals I L, but I mean the two, you can you can interchange the two since they're equal, right? So on this side we see that I N equals I L. Technically, I guess you can call this I N minus V C over R, but you get the exact same expression at the end of the day, right? Okay. So because we know that V C over R goes here, right? So this is uh, v o v c whatever you want to call it well, we can call this i guess v o over r might be a bit more accurate so let's call it v o over r technically they're the same thing though so just to stay consistent we can call this v o and let's call this v o okay so that's i l minus v o over r there and then here we see that still regardless of whatever's going on in the uh, on the switching side i n is still equal to i l so now we have a, a, a set of equations for both conditions um, when the transistor is conducting and then when it's not. We also want to define something. We, we usually define uh, conversion ratio D, right? Uh, we also often, not always, but often uh, define D prime as being equal to 1 minus D. And the reason I'm using lowercase d here, uh, in reality we usually use D as the uppercase, right? But that's, I'm imagining this is the sort of DC version of a duty cycle. What I mean is no variations, right? So I'm assuming that this thing can vary in general, which is why all of these are lowercase. And so I'm saying that this is a potentially variable duty cycle. In reality, it may or may not be, but for now we're going to assume that it is potentially variable. So this, if I were to, call, to consider this in the, in the type of analysis that we're used to, this would be a capital D prime equals one minus D prime, or sorry, one minus D, not D prime, um, like that. But for now, we're going to keep it general. And so this is sort of what ties the whole thing together. And then you have these two different conditions. So this is one, and then this is two, right? And so they just, basically, there's two different parts of the switching cycle. So this is from zero to DT, and this is from DT to T, okay? So now what we're going to do is we're going to average these equations over one switching period, okay? And the way we do that is we multiply whatever that voltage is times the duration that it, that it, uh, that it, it is it is valid for, and then we divide it by the period, right? And we've done this before, so if you're not familiar with how to do this process, um, again, I'll link the video for the boost converter in the description, and we find the average of the of the of the inductor voltage in that video. We're basically doing the exact same thing, but the equations that we're dealing with now look different because uh, we're generalizing the components and we're trying to we're trying to get a different type of model. So the equation might look slightly different, but the process is the same. You, draw, you can draw the waveforms, take the uh, integral, and then divide it by the period. You'll get the exact same result. Okay, so if we average over one switching cycle, let's call it T or TS, then we'll find that VL average is equal to L D by DT, IL average, of course. And this is going to be equal to D times VN average plus D prime, which is 1 minus D, remember, uh, VN minus VO, both averages, okay? So this over bar here we're representing as average. Sometimes people will use uh, an average uh, symbol like this, so these sort of uh, brackets like that. Uh, we're gonna stick with the over bar for now uh, because it's simpler to draw and it makes the equations look a bit better overall. But if you see that in some of the literature, don't be alarmed, that's what they're referring to. And so we have now IC, we can do the exact same thing for IC. So IC average is gonna be CD by DT, and we can call this VC average, right? And so this is going to be minus D VC average, well, VO average, we called it, right? Over R plus D prime I L average minus VO over R, right? That's what we did over there as well, I think. Just make sure of that. Yes, so it's consistent. Okay, so we use VO on this side, we use VC on this side. But technically we know that VC is equal to VO, and we know that IL is equal to IN. Right, so you can you can make those uh, adjustments if you need to. Okay, and then we also know that IN, IN average is equal to IL average. Okay, cool. So next what we're going to do is we're going to substitute in this D prime equals 1 minus D, okay? So we're going to take this and we're going to apply it to all of these equations. Well, only really these, those two. And then we're going to have an equation that's going to be entirely in terms of uh, D. Uh, well, D prime, I guess, right? It depends on which way you want to take it. So what we're going to do is we're going to have it in terms of D prime, okay? And then we'll relate things back and forth however we want to.
So what we're going to do is after we apply that substitution, we're going to have everything in terms of d prime. If we do that, we end up with L d by dt, I L average is equal to Vn minus d prime Vo prime. Sorry, not Vo prime, it's just d prime. This is over bar, and this is also average. So these should both be average. Um, maybe we draw a little like a line here, so we know that this is the next step. Okay, and then we have C d by dt, v c average is going to equal d prime i l average minus v o over r average. Okay, and then of course there's nothing really changing here, so i n average is still equal to i l average. So nothing changes here. Now this equation here, you'll notice. Um, is uh, still nonlinear, okay? This might be, a, it's an average waveform, um, so it's time invariant because we've averaged out the time, right? And yeah, you might have these, um, you might have these time derivatives here, but remember, what do we have? We have this thing is equal to VL, so this is actually VL, and this is IC. And we know that, remember from the volt second balance, we know that the average of the inductor voltage over one period is equal to zero. That means this thing equals zero. Then we also know that the average of the capacitor charge uh, is also equal to zero. So this is also going to equal zero. I'm not gonna set these equal to zero right now, but what I'm trying to prove to you at this point is, or, or trying, trying to argue at this point, is that these equations are time invariant. You might see the time derivative here, but they're time invariant. They don't depend on time. They are averages. Okay? When we, when we actually go further in, we'll see that everything kind of works out that way, and we'll end up with equations that are not, uh, sorry, that they are linear and they are time invariant. That's usually the, the best way to model, or the most convenient uh, type of models we can develop are linear and time invariant models. So, how do we deal with the nonlinearity, and how do we know these are nonlinear? Because they have derivative relationships, right? So, the nonlinearity can be removed by assuming that each parameter is subject to some some small variation. This perturbation that I was talking about before, right? So, what we're going to do is we're going to replace each variable. Let's call some let's get some generic variable x with some DC value and some AC value. Okay, so any variable x is going to be replaced by this. Okay, and so one thing I should also uh, sort of address is that if d prime equals one minus d, then we know that this will end up equaling d uh, minus d like this. Okay, so I just want to get that uh, sort of definition as well. And if you're confused as to how you get this, remember that we're going to we're going to substitute d equals d plus d hat, and if you have this. And then you take you say one minus this, you'll end up with d prime minus d hat. So you can work this out on your own. It's a, fair, it's a fairly simple, a couple of steps to do that. Okay, so we're going to replace each variable in that manner, right? And we're not going to set anything equal to zero yet. So you have uh, d over dt here, and this is going to be i l plus i l hat, and this is going to equal v n plus v n hat minus d prime minus d prime um, and then this will be sorry d prime hat and this will be v o plus v o hat and on this side you'll have c d by d t and this will be uh, we call it v c plus v c hat and this will be minus one over r same thing here so it's going to be v o plus v o hat here plus d prime minus d prime hat, and this will be i l plus i l hat, like that. And of course here you have i, well, that's not i n, i n like this, plus i n hat equals i l plus i l hat, like that, okay? Now, still, we cannot assume this is linear, right? Because there's there's nothing here that says that these small variations in uh, AC values results in any uh, guaranteed linearity for whatever's going on. So what we can do then 
is we can take this one step further. So what we're going to do is we're going to consider the separate cases, the DC case and the AC case separately, right? So this is only linear for small AC variations, but still nonlinear in the DC case. So how do we distinguish the two? So if we consider the DC case, what we do is we consider all these DC values. So we have IL, VN, D prime, VO, like this, right? And so you can take this and you can turn it into a sort of DC equation. Okay, so if we turn this into a DC equation for, for all the cases, what we can end up with, or what we will end up with, is we'll end up with L D by DT. So this is the DC case, keep that in mind. So this is IL, and this is going to be VN minus D prime VO. Okay, now remember, I said this thing equals zero because that's what the volt second balance is, right? So this is not time varying. Also, you can think of it as IL is constant because this is a constant value. This is a DC value we're saying, right? Because that the other the other component was the AC. This is a sort of DC fixed component. And so if we have that, then you can say that here you end up with um, VN equals D prime VO. And we said that VN, sorry, we said that D prime is one minus D. This is VO. Uh, sorry, it's not equals, it should just be multiplied by. So if this is just multiplied by VO, then you get that VO over VN. Then there shouldn't be anything here, that was a mistake, sorry. Uh, this is going to be equal to 1 over 1 minus D, which is exactly the conversion ratio of the boost converter, right? So now we've arrived at the sort of the DC case. And by DC, I'm using, I use DC as a sort of loose term. I mean, it's constant, really, it's not variable. But we've arrived at that exact same model based on this uh, different analysis. So you can implicitly determine both uh, models using this approach. Okay, so we have this as the DC case, and then we can do the exact same thing for the capacitor charge, for instance, and um, and do the exact same thing for the, um, well, the, in the inductor current is, it doesn't really make much of a difference. But if we do the same thing for the capacitor, we can say that this is D over DT, and this is VC, and this is minus VO over R plus D prime IL. You can use this to determine the current conversion ratio as well, right? Because you have this is this is basically IO, this is IN. If you set this equal to zero, you can find the current current conversion ratio, which is just the inverse of this. So I'm not going to do that. But the point is, I mean, the 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 whole analysis is consistent with what we do in the other case, the one that we've already seen. And then of course, just for the sake of completeness, we have IL or sorry, IN equals IL, like that. So the DC model is implicit as we advertised. Now what we need to do is we need to develop the small signal AC model, and then we're gonna use that small signal AC model to develop a new circuit. And that circuit will be built entirely on linear circuit components. There won't be any switches, there won't be anything like that. There'll be a bunch of different components that we know how to analyze using linear circuit analysis techniques that you would have learned in any introductory electronics or electric circuit analysis course. So what are we left with? Let's take a look at these equations we had. So the green was the DC case. If I look at the AC case, or the small signal case, we end up with these parameters here, right? So then you have all, anything that has a hat on it, basically. And we're going to multiply all of these out, and we'll end up with a bunch of different terms, okay? So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to do that here. So what's the first term? The first term will be L D I L hat by DT is going to equal V N hat minus D prime V O hat plus uh, what D hat V O plus D hat V O hat. Okay, and then we're going to have the other equation for the capacitor. It's going to be D I sorry D V D V C hat by D T is going to equal minus V O hat over R plus D prime I L hat minus D hat I L minus D hat I L hat. Now, is this equation linear? If you ask yourself and you look at it as it is, you might think yes, I'm going to say no. The reason why is because of this, these two terms here. These are higher order terms. This is not part of a linear model. So since this is not part of a linear model, 
I'm going to ignore these terms because these will not contribute, these do not contribute anything to a linear relationship. This is not a linear relationship. These are second order terms, right? So their behavior will be different. It'll be modeled differently. So we're not going to consider that. We're only considering linear terms for this model. Okay, and what I'm going to do then is we also have, of course, I in hat equals I L hat. So this, or the, I guess this system of equations, is basically what we're going to use to construct a new circuit model, okay? What I should also mention, well, I should remind you, not mention, is that, remember, this is VL, and this is IC, and this is IN, obviously. Okay, so this is the, the first term, it represents the voltage across the inductor. The second term, or second equation, first equation is the voltage of the inductor. Second equation is the vo a capacitor current. And then the third equation is really just the input current. Okay, so how can we use this to develop a circuit model? What I'm going to do is I'm going to start with, I'm going to start with two elements really. Well, we can start with, let's start with four elements, okay? I'm going to start with an input voltage because I know I have to have an input voltage. And I'm going to start with a resistor at the load, although anything could be at the load. I'm going to use a resistor because that's the simplest case. Okay, now we know that we have an inductor here because we know that I in, I in is equal to I L, right? This is I L. So we know that the inductor must be attached to this voltage source. This is, this is V in hat. Everything here should have a hat. Okay, so this, the equation tells us this. So if you're confused as to how I got this or how, how you figure this out, the equation right here is telling us, right here, like it's telling us the input current is the same as the inductor current. That means the inductor must be connected to the input, right? Okay, so that's one element out of the way for now. What else do we have? We have that we're going to, I mean, we must have a capacitor somewhere because the other equation that is uh, required or that's modeling our system here is we, well, first of all, we have this resistor here and we know that this voltage here is VO hat right? And so we know that the, well, the capacitor voltage is going to be equal to, or the capacitor current, sorry, is going to be equal to minus VO over R, right? So this term here tells us that there must be a current that leaves this upper node that is equal to VO over R, which means this capacitor must connect to this resistor. Otherwise, this current can never exist. This minus VO of R cannot exist. Okay, so this is kind of what we knew to be true before, right? We, 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 we've known, we know that our model looks like this before. What we had before was we had a switch here and then we had a diode here. So uh, in, the, in the other case, we've seen that there's a switch here and then there's a diode here. And that, but that introduces nonlinearity to our circuit. How do we analyze a transfer function or how do we develop a transfer function when we have these two switches in there. It's very difficult to, it's basically impossible. That's what we did this entire process, right? So if you don't have switches, then you can analyze things linearly. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is, I'm going to remind you, well, first of all, this is L, and I'm going to remind you by first getting rid of this IL here. Maybe we can draw it here, like that. And I'm going to remind you that this is VL. Okay, okay, now, I'm also going to remind you that this whole expression at the top, this one, is VL. So that means VL equals VN hat minus D prime VO hat plus D uh, hat VO. Okay, these are all voltage drops, meaning I can model these as voltage sources. Okay, so what that means is I'm going to have one voltage here and I'm drawing this as a dependent source for a reason, and I'll explain that in a second, and I'm gonna have another voltage source here, okay? Now, since the, um, the we're assuming that the variations in the duty cycle are the independent variable, and the reason I'm doing that is because usually when we control these things, we we vary the duty cycle. By these things, I mean uh, power converters. So when we control a power converter, we vary the duty cycle so as to control the relationship between the input and the output voltage, meaning that's a control variable, meaning that's an independent variable, meaning you have to, that has to be an independent voltage source. Okay, so you're going to change that sort of d hat 
Okay, so if you do that, that d hat that you change uh, will represent this volt, will, or will basically be this voltage here. And, and the, the, the polarity is determined based on the sign of the drop here. So this is plus d hat v o. So you would go up in voltage here, that's a positive here. You would go down, that's a minus, so that doesn't really matter. But you would basically come, this side is going to have to be um, a, a drop. So it's going to be plus, minus. So it's going to be plus at the top, minus at the bottom here. So be plus, minus, like that. And then this one will be minus, plus, because again, the, the sign there is plus, right? So this is going to be d hat v o. And it's an independent, because again, d hat is the, is the variable that we're controlling here. And here we're going to have d prime, and this will be v o hat, like that. Okay, so that's that's it for this equation. We've basically accounted for all the terms in the first equation. Now in the second equation, we have one of these currents was v o over r. We've done that. Now, we have two other, we have one, if I go by the same logic that I can control d hat, then this term is going to be an independent term, and this term will be a dependent term. Okay, so I'm going to have two currents, basically. I'm going to have one current like this, and I'm going to have another current that's going to be dependent. Okay, and so now which one's which? And which way are they going? So if I consider this here to be IC, right, I see that minus VO over R means this goes out, it's in the opposite direction, as I see. Plus this term means it should be going into that node. And then minus this term means it, this second term, this d hat term should be going out. What that tells us is that this d hat term should be going down and that this one should be going up. Because then when you look at this node, this current enters this node, this current leaves this node. And that's consistent with the signs we have there. So now what are these here? So this one here will be, this is the independent term, so this is d hat i l. Sorry, that's a d, that's a, should be an uppercase i l. Maybe we can erase that, because that was... So this is d hat i l, and this one here will be d prime i l hat, and the i l is equal to i n, right? So I mean, the two currents are related. Now, if you look at this circuit, you see that this whole thing, maybe we use this color, different color. This whole thing, if we call this one and we call this two, this comes from two, right? And this whole circuit or whole part of the circuit comes from one. So you've basically created a very linear circuit. We know how to analyze this using linear circuit techniques. KVL, KCLs, node analysis, mesh analysis, whatever you want to call it. You can analyze the circuit and get a relationship between the input and the output in terms of all these different variables. Okay, so if we take it one step further, and if you stop and look for a sec, you'll notice that this combination here, these two dependent sources, actually represent something, and, 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 and they represent a different circuit element. So, this circuit element that they represent, if you look at it carefully again, you'll, you'll, you'll be able to figure it out fairly easily, but this is basically a transformer. Now, I'm not saying your converter is a transformer. What I'm saying, or that it provides any isolation or any turns, or no. What I'm saying is you can model this relationship between these two elements as being a transformer. And so if you do that, you can simplify your circuit models, and you can analyze this type of model in like a simulation, for instance, if you want to. Uh, or you can analyze this uh, in, in a sort of circuit analysis uh, format. Or you can reflect the entire right side over to the left side or left side to the right side, depending on what it is you're trying to do. So why don't we take a look at what this looks like overall then? So you have an inductor here. I'm going to move the voltage source above here. We have this transformer here now. Again, this is a fictitious transformer. It's not a real transformer. But what we're saying is that the converter has this sort of transformation property. And we know that to be true because that's how the relationship between the inputs and the outputs changes. If it didn't, uh, well, if it didn't have the transformation characteristic, then it, we wouldn't have any difference between these two. And so here we see that this, the dot convention will be the, on, uh, both are on the upper side there. And this is a D prime to one transformer. Okay. And on this side, we have V in hat. And on this side, we have V O hat. 
And of course we have, this is L, this is still C, this is still R. And this thing here, we're going to label this as, this was D hat I L. And this thing we're going to label as, in that direction, D hat V O. And sometimes what they'll do is they'll, like textbooks might do this, they'll put like a little, little thing like this to show that this is a small signal AC transformer. Although I guess you can't really use a transformer in DC anymore. Well, you can, but it just wouldn't do what you want it to do. In any case, we can label this as IN, and we can label this as IC if we want. And so now we have this model. And so you see this model is completely, you can analyze this completely. You can develop a transfer function for this by analyzing it in the S domain, by representing things as J omega, whatever you want to do. You can draw frequency responses for this. You can, you can use it to determine bandwidths. You can use it to determine anything you want, basically. Right, and so when you have something like this, then you can design a closed loop control uh, system around this entire uh, model. But when you had a system or you had a circuit that looks like this, you can't really do anything with it because you don't know what the input output relationship is for small signal variations. The dynamic characteristics of this are not obvious. In fact, they're all, they're basically impossible to determine just by looking at this. Right? So that's why you need to apply all of these type of um, conditions and character uh, and sort of do this analysis, really. Um, so yeah, so what did we do? Again, we looked at this, we looked at this simple model of what we're used to with the boost converter. We applied these three steps here. And the first step there, well, also, we keep in mind that we need the inductor voltage always. You need the, If you're doing this analysis, you need the inductor voltage, capacitor current, and then input current. Because the input current will tell you how everything is connected internally here. The capacitor current and, and, and inductor voltage will then tell you what's connected to the rest of the circuits after, right? So you analyze this in its two sort of sub-intervals, um, I guess. We apply this condition here, this D prime. And then you analyze each one of these after averaging, right? So we average all of these, we take the average of this, we multiply things out, we figure out what's going on in that sense. We realize that we have um, we have this model, which is a little more simplified, I guess. So it's just a cleaner equation. We apply this perturbation here, and then we end up with this here, right? And I think I made a mistake here. So this part, I believe, is okay. Um, sorry, let me just double check that so I'm not making any mistakes. This should be, this shouldn't be, not, this should not be primed. I apologize. These should not be primed. Because this is, D prime is equal to this, right? So, um, that should be with the, with, the, with, the, with the perturbation, basically. So we're replacing it with that. I should, I should basically say that if you have plus uh, D prime. So, what I'm trying to say is, I mean, maybe we can, we can fix that right now. So what I'm trying to say is, if I have D prime, and I replace D prime, so if D prime equals one minus D, and I replace this with one minus D plus D hat, then I end up with one minus D minus D hat, right? And one minus D, this one minus D is D prime minus D hat. So that's what should be here. That's why I had to fix this. So I apologize if that caused any confusion earlier. Um, so this is D prime minus D hat is what should be here, which is what you see here. And you'll notice that at the end, I, I didn't carry the, issue, the, the mistake through. So that was just a mistake in writing these two equations. In any case, we then say that we can break up this uh, big equation into two smaller equations. And this one is sort of for the DC model. And I use DC loosely again, because it's not technically DC, it's just a constant. Uh, this is the small signal model. So this is small signal, sometimes we'll call it AC, AC model. And that's what you end up here. And again, these are second order terms. So we ignore those, we neglect the second order terms, because they won't be moving or varying at the same rate. So we don't consider them. Okay, and then what we saw is that we have these equations, and that these equations actually represent the inductor voltage and capacitor current. And so then we can account for those by adding voltage sources and current sources, right? So if we know that the inductor voltage is equal to Vn minus d prime vo hat plus d hat vo, then you can just add those voltage sources here and say, look, this is the model we have. And now we've modeled the entire circuit in a linear fashion after doing the same thing for the capacitor current.
So you can use this technique um, and then sort of simplify with a transformer. Although the transformer is not necessary, but you can, because then you can kind of simplify this by reflecting everything over to the left or right if you need to. Otherwise, you can analyze this model directly as well, because you know you can express one side in terms of the other, and that's what these dependent voltage and current sources are doing. You can apply this technique to any converter, uh, the buck converter, buck boost converter, flyback, anything, you name it, you can do this. But in some cases, this model is insufficient. And those are cases where there might be large variations, right? So this is a small signal variation, basically. In most cases, you can ensure, for example, in like a switch mode power supply, you can ensure that you won't have large variations. And in most nominal operating conditions, you can usually ensure that there won't be too great of a variation because that would result. That would usually be the result of some, you know, uh, undesirable or unfavorable conditions. And so that would usually have its own sort of mechanism to deal with it. But in under standard operating conditions, you would have usually very controlled and very mild sort of variations of some relatively small number. But even then, you can take this model, and it's a pretty good model for most applications, and you can develop whatever types of converters and applications and power supplies and such that you would like. So, I hope this was helpful. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. I know this was a bit longer than most videos, but again, it's a, it's a fairly technical subject, that's why. Um, like and subscribe to support the channel, and we'll see you in the next one.